Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, the 21st of July 2015, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish. With me in the studio, but behind the technical desk, is uh, Nick Green. Uh, well, the weather here in Plymouth, pretty sunny at the moment, a uh, few clouds around. I'm getting similar reports across the country. North of the border, I think it's a bit mixed. Um, I think we'll leave it there. Well, what is happening in the UK? What's happening in the world? Serious things. Uh, we're going to start off by um, a report on the Ben Fellows, Ken Clark court case, uh, which is continuing today in London. Um, now, the uh, BBC, most of the mainstream press have picked up on this story. We've gone for the mail here. Child actor invented claims he had been groped by Tory MP Ken Clark during undercover investigation. Uh, it says that uh, Ben Fellows alleged he was groped by former Chancellor of the Exchequer. He claimed it was while he was working for, un sorry, he was working undercover for ITV's Cook Report in 1994. And he gave a statement to the police probing historical child abuse at Westminster. But now he is accused of fabricating claims and is on trial at the Old Bailey. So this is very, very heavy stuff. Uh, it goes on to say that uh, he alleged that the former Chancellor of the Exchequer plied him with alcohol and carried out the sexual assault in the office of a lobbyist while he was working undercover for ITV's Cook Report in 1994. Uh, uh, and then just to re-emphasise, but it's it's fellows himself that's appeared at the Old Bailey accused of perverting the course of justice after making allegedly um, false claims. That's the uh, grammatical error of the mail there, not uh, the UK column um, in relation to Mr. Clark. So um, very serious um, business indeed. Of course, uh, we're not allowed to talk in too much detail because the case is progressing. Uh, but what we can say is that uh, from the time Ben Fellows reported his story to the police, it was rapidly clear police were not acting. And uh, of course, Ben Fellows himself um, alleges that the police were particularly brutal in the way that uh, uh, they... Um, uh, broke into his family's house and uh, frightened, harassed his uh, parents. <clears throat> we'll wait and see whether more comes out on that in the report. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, let's have a look at how local papers deal with this. Of course, the Nottingham Post, extremely interested. Assault claims against Ken Clark were fantasy here. Here's Old Bailey. Uh, it's an interesting headline. Of course, other mainstream papers have used the same word, fantasy. Uh, it brought into my mind recollections of the judge in the court case of Melanie Shaw when he said that Operation Daybreak in Nottingham was a conspiracy theory. Uh, well, what did uh, the Nottingham Post want to say? They were very keen to point out that Mr Clark has represented Rushcliffe in Nottinghamshire as a Conservative MP since 1970. Uh, he was interviewed apparently, but detectives took no further action and shifted their uh, investigation to the defendant, Ben Fellows. Uh, well, of course, this is a fascinating uh, situation uh, with many other victims. We've seen that once they've come forward to report their stories of abuse to the police, um, miraculously, the British police seem to turn on them and of course, this is a very interesting subject for the UK column itself, because having gone into a local police station in Plymouth uh, some years ago to report the uh, physical abuse of a young baby in South Wales at the hands of South Wales Social Services, we ended up with uh, a Plymouth policeman shouting at us at the top of his voice to get out of his interview room. And of course, this instantly made us question why would uh, Devon and Cornwall police be so frightened of members of the public reporting child abuse? And indeed, why would this uh, Devon and Cornwall officer become so aggressive? And of course, uh, uh, Ben Fellows has consistently said that the attitude of the police uh, when he made his report was not uh, caring and sympathetic, but became incre increasingly brutal. Well, where does this take the mainstream press? Well, not very far. UK columns, 
always got a different approach. So we thought we'd uh, have a little focus on our illustrious Prime Minister, David Cameron. And uh, we'd like to thank the Financial Times uh, for an article of some years ago, um, which said this, Cameron, the consummate spin doctor. And this uh, article start to, started to delve into David Cameron's career with Carlton TV uh, as head of communications. And it raises some very interesting points. Why should we be interested in Carlton TV? Well, stay with us because uh, we'll take you through a little journey on this subject. Uh, well, this was uh, a key part of the article. It said, Mr. Cameron's Car Carlton career, his only job outside politics, began in September 1994 when he was 27. The former special advisor had pulled strings to land the post. Annabel Astor, his future mother-in-law, persuaded Mr. Green from Carlton to take on a man with no corporate PR or investor relations experience. Uh, well, that's quite interesting. Um, but uh, what we then learn from this uh, very good article from the Financial Times is that in a series of run-ins with financial journalists, Mr. Cameron developed a reputation for arrogance, evasiveness, and in one case, alleged mendacity that dogged him during his attempt to become Tory leader in 2005 and may resurface during the imminent general election. Now, this was written in, back in 2010, of course. So something uh, going on at Carlton TV. Uh, if you research this subject on the Internet, uh, a simple Google search, David Cameron, Carlton TV, uh, raises a number of entries uh, where people are clearly questioning um, Cameron's relationship with this company. And of course, what, uh, what is a key part of the questions raised is uh, his relationship with tapes uh, produced by the Cook Report uh, and uh, held at one stage by Carlton. So we can simply say here, internet awash with questions regarding David Cameron's role in the Cook Report tapes at uh, Carlton TV. How can, we, uh, how can we have a look at this in a slightly uh, simpler way? Well, we thought it was appropriate to uh, do a UK column network diagram. So let's have a look at that. Uh, we should have it on screen. Here we are. Uh, cash for questions and dirty deeds in the media. So let's go back to the Cook Report. Um, taking place between 1987 and 1998, produced by Central TV or ITV. And of course, uh, Ben Fellows uh, is alleging that he was part of the uh, Secret Cook report, which was effectively conducting a sting operation on uh, politicians in Westminster. So bear that in mind as we have a little look at how this uh, particular investigation by the Cook Report developed. Now, what sort of thing were they doing? Well, they were investigating serious criminal activity, not only in Britain, but worldwide. And uh, the programme rapidly uh, became very popular with audiences. And we understand that the audience uh, level peaked at some 12 million viewers. Um, in 1994, the Cook Report worked with the Guardian newspaper on MPs' cash for questions. And uh, the televised Cook Report for cash for questions was uh, strangely shelved. And in fact, it was the only documentary uh, out of 130 that the Cook Report made that was cancelled in this way. The moment it was cancelled, the Guardian newspaper uh, continued alone and ultimately ran the cash for questions story in October 1994, alleging Ian Greer had bribed two MPs. Now, this is the point at which it gets very interesting because journalists subsequently investigated the Guardian work on that cash for questions story. And over a number of years, their, their well-documented research uh, using published reports, interviews, and indeed court papers uh, said that uh, the whole of the Guardian story over cash for questions was a scam and it was a calculated scam 
that had been designed to oust from power the then Conservative government of Prime Minister John Major. So if we uh, put uh, the key website in the centre of the screen, uh, we would encourage viewers and listeners to go and have a look at guardianlies.com uh, where in a very simple website there is a great deal of factual documentary and other evidence uh, which uh, in our mind clearly shows that something untoward was going on in the way the Guardian newspaper and indeed journalists working for the Guardian at that time had uh, ramped up and um, effectively claimed prizes for their work in exposing the so-called cash for question story. So that is the background against which, of course, the Ben Fellows trial is now taking place uh, because Ben Fellows is saying that as a very young man, he was taking part as part of that deep undercover Cook reporting, which, as we can now see, was not only uh, looking at the type of MPs that were in Parliament, but just what activities they were getting up to uh, with regard to taking money in order to pose questions. Uh, we will try and report on this uh, further, but do have a look at that website. And I think many of you will be very, very surprised to see the uh, information and research presented. Well, we're going to say uh, whatever we think of the Ben Fellows Ken Clark trial, let us remember that the subject of child abuse, particularly when it involves those in positions of power, is a very, very serious matter indeed. And as just one example, we'd like to remind you of the Mirror uh, reporting on this story uh, of a missing boy who was thought to have been murdered by a VIP paedophile ring and subsequently his disappearance and murder covered up. And this is 15-year-old Martin Allen, who vanished in London in 1979 and was last seen boarding a tube train at King's Cross Station. Now, this uh, particular incident uh, has featured in the recent Australian Channel 9 60 Minutes uh, documentary on paedophilia in Westminster and around British uh, politicians. And, uh, of course, one of the key things that uh, this documentary has claimed is that senior police officers, senior British police officers, halted investigations into paedophilia and serious child abuse in order to protect very powerful people. And by that, uh, we mean members of the political elite in Westminster and indeed the establishment. And I will say from our own work over now, uh, several years trying to help um, survivors of child abuse, uh, the common theme with those coming forward to the UK column is always that when they go for help to the authorities, to local authorities, charities, they go to the police, they are met with a wall of callous indifference. And uh, more and more child abuse survivors are now saying that actually it was the authorities that claim they're there to protect the children who have indeed been... Uh, helping to abuse them, or at least covering up that abuse. Well, our comments over recent days about what's been happening um, with the subject of child abuse led to us receiving um, an email this morning, and I thought the text was so interesting we would uh, read it out. Uh, this is uh, the message as received. It says, re-NSPCC. I did temporary work there in the early 2000s and was distressed to see how they treated childline employees who were mainly women of colour, who were poorly paid and not trained as far as I know, despite doing a harrowing job. I noticed in a centre in Manchester an appeal for childline volunteers for NSPCC. It is outrageous and irresponsible for people not to be paid for this work. I have no idea if they check on applicants or train them. Certainly when I worked there, NSPCC had very swanky offices between Liverpool Street and, and Spitterfields and a state-of-the-art IT system that coordinated all resources. It was just after Victoria Klimby's, Klimbier's case and the department I worked in was busy writing guidelines for social workers, etc. 
My boss commuted from Staley Bridge to London every week, and so it must have been on a fair salary. I note Peter Wanless is on over £160,000 per annum, according to the 2013-14 accounts, as opposed to people at the sharp end getting nothing. Clearly a lucrative business, but unclear what happens to children who ring in. Now, we've just read that uh, text as it's been sent in to us. And we're going to say that, of course, it raises a lot of interesting questions about who is paid and who is not. Uh, but the minimum we can say is it appears to be yet another member of the public who has got some serious concerns about how the child protection system in UK does or indeed does not work. Well, just a quick advert for the UK Column. If you're new to UK Column News, or perhaps you haven't visited the UK Column website yet, please do. Uh, we are promoting this particular article at the moment uh, because as we start to see the power of the European Union unleashing its hand in UK, uh, there is a requirement to explain exactly how this subversive European work is taking place. So I encourage you to have a look at empire building under the radar, how Europe uses its external action service. Well, we'll also say to you that uh, tomorrow, because we're not able to do a, uh, a news program, uh, we're going to be showing um, a video interview that I conducted a few days ago with Ian Puddick. And Ian, of course, is the uh, London plumber um, who suffered uh, an incredibly um, har um, harassing and bullying action by uh, City of London police, uh, which used anti-terrorist units and cost them between one and a half and three million pounds simply to silence him because he spoke out about an affair that his wife had with a member of a, a senior member of a prestigious London company. Uh, this is part of the BBC News report. Uh, web revenge husband Ian Puddick cleared and the reason uh, we're using this as our advert is that uh, according to Ian Puddick, BBC Home Affairs editor Geaton Portal simply failed to report the true facts from the trial and therefore really distorted the story taking public attention off the gross misappropriation of police um, money and uh, units as they progress the case against Ian Puddick. So if you can join us at uh, one o'clock tomorrow, that should be played out live by the UK Column live stream. Well, we've just mentioned the police and what better man to call up on screen than uh, Bernard Hogan Howe. And here we are, Metropolitan Police. Uh, it's now been decided that all new police constables must be able to speak a second language from today. Recruits will need to speak English and one of 14 designated languages to join the country's biggest force. Now, we think that this is an absolutely planned, calculated and deeply cynical breakup of the UK. Um, London has always been designated to be a city region by the European Union, no longer to be our capital, uh, to, but to be a city region. And uh, of course, by bringing in language restrictions, what is clearly going to happen very quickly is that we're going to have the British capital policed uh, by uh, policemen and women whose background is from overseas, predominantly Eastern Europe. And of course, that means that they have no national loyalty or indeed loyalty to the British community. We'll qualify that statement by, all, uh, by saying, as we always do, that of course these are people already in Britain who are being cynically used by David Cameron's uh, Conservative government to help break up the union. Where does this ideology come from? Well, perhaps we get a clue from uh, Sarah Thornton, former uh, chief of Thames Valley Police, now heading up the National uh, Police Chiefs uh, Committee. And... Uh, uh, she's been waxing lyrical on uh, reimagining policing and uh, her speech is now available on the internet but we thought it would be interesting to have a little look. Uh, so here we are. She states this lecture is about policing but I think it has a wider application. 
public service reform was at the heart of Blair's government ambition and, and the Prime Minister's delivery unit. And she's saying, of course, that unit had a central role. It's been fashionable to knock Sir Michael Barber's deliverology, but as I've thought about this lecture, I have been struck by the absence of any one big idea about trans transformation across government. Um, nudge, big society and what works have been talked up, but have not yet taken off. I have been involved with the chief of the Defence Staff Strategy Forum and Her Majesty's Court Service Transformation Steering Group. Both are grappling with very similar issues, looking to technology innovators for inspiration. So this is remarkable language by a woman who is supposed to be policing Britain. Uh, she's clearly unable to do that because she left Thames Valley Police with that police force having been publicly shown to have neglected and failed to protect vulnerable young female child abuse victims. And of course, many members of the public saying that Thames Valley Police absolute disgrace under the hand of this woman. And the reason we suspect that she can't police is because she's too busy with a political agenda, which obviously includes nudging big society, transformation of Britain. And she's even now been elevated to work with Chief of the Defence Staff Strategy Forum. So we would like to ask um, the British government and indeed anybody else who's prepared to follow up on the question, uh, just what is this woman up to? But note her language, because, of course, Sarah Thornton is a senior common purpose graduate. She's been chosen as a future leader. And therefore, we can imagine that her agenda is very much the common purpose agenda, uh, which is to uh, break down the British nation state and to leave us at the mercy of the European Union. UK Column has been warning, warning on this subject. If we go back to 2007, a very early edition of our newspaper was actually uh, warning about this police fall victim on common purpose. And we were pointing out that Devon and Cornwall police officers who had received common purpose training were then starting to wax lyrical uh, about visions and uh, this is what we said in the paragraph, Devon and Cornwall police haven't even got the cash for enough computers for their officers to do their jobs, uh, nor can they now afford to run the necessary unmarked police cars, yet they do have enough money for officers to change the world. Following some £57,000 of taxpayers' money already squandered on the local police, on common, sorry, by the local police on common purpose training, Chief Inspector X, head of the custody unit, and his colleague Y, head of unit administration, were the latest policemen to be gushing common purpose cult speak. Uh, they are now both publicly committed to help instill a new culture in our own organisation, which would end up positively affecting the lives of millions of people. So here they are, no longer bothered with policing the streets of Plymouth, and Devon and Cornwall, they are going to try and positively affect the lives of millions of people. And if we have a look at uh, the second objective at the bottom, in an organisation that historically has not been overly keen on creativity, we're taking the lid off the box and providing a unique opportunity for our leaders to learn and truly lead. Not one word of policing. Uh, what we've got here is common purpose cult speak uh, that these future leaders are now going to transform Britain and indeed transform the world. Dangerous stuff, particularly in the hands of our senior police officers. Well, of course, uh, British Prime Minister David Cameron is himself a common purpose uh, guru. Uh, he's on the common purpose website as backing this organisation. And uh, why should we be interested in our King David? Uh, well, of course, he's up to more war overseas. Let's have a look at the report from The Independent. Uh, here you have it. David Cameron extremis extremism speech. The Prime Minister's Churchillian posturing over Syria is misguided. And essentially, this is an article which starts off talking about tornadoes. But before we get on to that, let's just have a look at what's in the background. 
because the one nation, one united kingdom, which is something David Cameron is consistently pushing now, is the great Cameron lie. Because while this man pr promotes unity, what he's actually doing is breaking up and destroying the United Kingdom. Just one example, the Herald Scotland here, uh, casually saying, well, the SNP is telling the rest of UK, don't worry about independence. It's not really a threat. Uh, we're just uh, breaking away. Well, UK Column was absolutely warning about this back in 2008. Uh, again, an early edition of the paper uh, from November of that year, EU reform treaty, and uh, we're saying exactly what was planned, which is that Britain was slowly to be broken up into pieces. These are the European regions, Scotland to become independent, Wales to become independent, even Cornwall working with very dubious organisations inside the EU to gain independence and uh, ultimately the rest of England to be broken up in regions, significantly with London being designated a European city region, as I've already said, no longer the capital. And uh, we added more because, of course, we've consistently said what this is. It's treason, uh, but for the public, they need to think through this uh, because the words are very poisonous but softly spoken. So how does David Cameron do it? Let's bring him on screen. Here's that article again. And um, we're going to give quite a bit of credit to Robert Fisk from The Independent uh, because he's definitely started to think. Let's have a look at what he says. He says that the problem with the prime minister saying he's going to unleash war on ISIS uh, in Syria is that our miserable eight tornado fighters on the jolly island of Cyprus won't make the slightest bit of difference to the bloody tragedy in Syria, let alone to ISIS. Now, how right this man is, because uh, whilst the RAF has flown about 126 missions, I think the Americans are up to about 6,000. And of course, the problem is that since David Cameron and his conservatives have been destroying British military capability, we have no aircraft left. And let's remind ourselves that Sky News recently reported that so bad is the maintenance uh, on our tornado fleet that missiles were simply dropping off on the runway. Uh, so perhaps we can say that uh, David Cameron's uh, one tornado for one nation policy seems to be working extremely well. But this is not uh, a humorous subject. At the end of the day, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people are dying as a result of unlawful wars created by David Cameron's British Conservatives. So if we dig into the article by Mr. Fisk, uh, let's have a look at what he says. He says this. Firstly, let us remember that we were going to bomb Assad's horrid army. Then we changed our mind. We would bomb the even more horrid ISIS army. Then when ISIS continued its expansion, war favouring guerrillas rather than air forces, we decided to bomb them even more than we'd bomb them even more than we'd been bombing them. It might have been better, needless to say, if we'd asked our Gulf Arab allies to stop sending weapons to the Syrian rebels who were giving them to the Islamists who in turn, we were bombing. So this man really now starting to uh, uh, work out that something untoward is going on. But this is not mis misguided. This is unlawful war unleashed by Prime Minister David Cameron on sovereign nation states while deliberately deceiving the British public as to what is going on. And I think it's appropriate to come back to the UK Column's own reports uh, because this was a report uh, back in 2012 uh, where our headline was, Where Shall I Invade Next? I've Done Libya. And of course, this was comments on what had already been reported in the mainstream media. In his Downing Street flat, uh, David Cameron is reported as joking to fellow Tories, Where Shall I Invade Next? I've Done Libya. His chilling comment and crude indifference to human suffering tells us a great deal about this man. He is a political psychopath. He's not concerned for Britain, nor is he concerned for the safety of British troops. 
nor is he concerned for the millions of civilians that he's helped kill in Iraq, Afghanistan and Libya. And uh, we were saying very clearly there that we've now got a prime minister, very dangerous, low empathy individual who thinks uh, uh, unleashing war on nation states is a little bit of a joke amongst his uh, Tory chums. The truth of the matter has come out. We've already reported this, but let's look at the background again. This is the Levant Report, a 2012 American Defense Intelligence Agency document. And what is it saying that the West will facilitate, will help create the rise of an Islamic State in order to isolate the Syrian regime? And if we go into the body of that text, um, here it is. Here it all is. They're going to create an Islamic state in order to get at Assad. And uh, the details are all there for you to read. So if you haven't seen this document, do go online and have a look at it. Uh, but the aim of the joint American-US policy is actually to create the terrorist groups in order to attack and destabilize and remove President Assad from Syria. Of course, this is the David Cameron who lost a vote in Westminster uh, when he tried to get a public mandate to attack Syria directly. So, um, sorry, um, Nick, we'll bring this one straight in. Let's remind ourselves here that, uh, of course, President Obama is now clearly on video on the Internet. Uh, what is he saying? Well, he's openly admitting that America is supporting the so-called terrorist groups, IS, uh, ISIL, and yet at home, bottom right-hand corner, uh, we've got a gentleman who was working for Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary who's been absolutely vilified because he is also supporting ISIL. So the UK comment there is, what's the problem? If Obama is supporting ISIL, uh, why can't Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary? Seems fair to us. Now, of course, we're not, we're not making light humour of what's happening here. What we are trying to do is show to the public that the British and American governments absolutely lying to their respective public over what they are doing with military forces behind our backs. Criminal activity by our own leaders. And once again, we're going to push very hard that it was Tory MP Brooks Newmark who was boasting of having been on the Turkish, Syrian-Turkish border with General Idris of the Free Syrian Army at a time when that organisation was clearly stating it was working with terrorist groups such as al-Nusra and al-Qaeda. So we ask once again, Mr Cameron, can you explain why your MP, former MP Brooks Newmark, was having meetings with those connected with the groups that you now claim are terrorist organisations. Uh, these are the two key areas. Uh, in his own words, Mr Newmarks said there are 150,000 free Syrian army fighters and 7,500 Jabat al-Nusra fighters which have links with al-Qaeda. And those people uh, were actually linked to General Idris and the free Syrian army with whom Brooks Newmark was meeting. Well, again, the UK column has uh, warned and warned about what is really happening here. And if you haven't seen it, please go to the uh, UK column uh, website. Uh, just do a search for seeing through the clash of civilization. And uh, you'll find this excellent article on psychological operations uh, written by Patrick Henningsen, where he was very clearly stating and warning uh, that uh, the British and American public being cynically deceived from, by their own governments who are actively creating war overseas. Well, uh, we'll end on the fact that uh, UK Column has set out to inform the public and we get no pleasure from saying that we have consistently been warning the British public uh, that the problems we're experiencing in UK today uh, be it with our own police or the uh, NHS, social services, child abuse, the rundown of the military. Wherever we look, the problem is created by our own government. And of course, these people are clearly not British 
and they clearly do not hold traditional uh, British values, should we be surprised. Uh, we're just bringing the second one there, uh, which is uh, uh, another front page that we did in which we set out the details of how David Cameron with his lookalike Nick Clegg uh, were going to conduct what we called the quizzling plan to change the whole culture of Britain. And I think there must be no doubt that that is exactly what we're seeing today, except we ha now have the added advantage of being able to see the true calibre of uh, our British politicians and the true calibre of the British government, and that is men and women who as a minimum are prepared to cover up the abuse of children in order to protect their positions. But of course, the reality is that at least some of those British politicians are paedophiles themselves. Thank you for joining us today. Just a reminder, no UK column news tomorrow, uh, but we will be running what is an extremely interesting interview with Ian Puddock, uh, having a look about his treatment by City of London Police and uh, subsequent erroneous reporting uh, by the BBC. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again on Thursday. Bye bye.